All right, we'll get started here. Um, seeing more of our attendees uh, filing in. Um, welcome to our 2023 webinar series. I'm, La I'm Lane Mosier. I'm the Sustainable Forest Education Cooperative uh, Education Program Specialist uh, working alongside Eli Sagor. Um, today, we're going to hear from Brian Schwingle with the Minnesota DNR's uh, Forest Health Team about some statewide uh, forest health updates. Um, feel free to put any questions in chat and we'll get to them at the end. Um, Brian, take it away. Hey, thanks, Lane, and thanks for the invite. Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, so let's just get started here. Uh, so these are the things I hope to cover in the next 45 minutes. It's going to be a whirlwind tour of stuff that we that myself and my teammates saw in 2022. Um, and I let, I'm going to start off with the things that I'm calling fun, fun stuff. Um, in other words, these are not things that are detrimental really to tree health. They're just really kind of interesting things that we saw on the job last year. And the first thing is uh, a shoot light outbreak. And so this is what it looked like. It was very subtle. Um, and the, the red splotches on the map on the right show you the areas where I saw this shoot light at on Red Oaks and on Burr Oaks. Um, and, you know, it, it was just something I noticed. I think it was, it was much more extensive than what this map is showing. Um, and the thing is, shoot light on oaks can be caused by many, many things. I can think of six things in my head right now that can cause shoot light. Um, and the first thing I do when I'm trying to diagnose this kind of thing is I just look for insect signs. So insects boring in the shoot, insects sucking on the cambium on the outside of the twig. And if I don't see any of those insects, then I just figure it's caused by a disease. And there are several different disease agents that can cause this. And so I collected some samples from various locations and I submitted them to University of Minnesota Plant Disease Clinic. And I got a call the day after I submitted the samples, then they said, Brian, this is being caused by an insect. And I felt like such a fool because it's easier to see insects than it is pathogens. Um, but this was the critter that was doing this very subtle damage. I had never seen it before in my career. And I don't think many people actually have. This is a very, very, very tiny beetle larva that was doing this damage. You can see on the picture on the right, they're making these tunnels in the cambial zone and outer sapwood that I mean, these are very tiny galleries on very tiny twigs, twigs that are less than a quarter inch in diameter at the very end of the branches. And I just thought this was so cool. This species, it doesn't have a common name, although you could call it an oak twig girdler. It's an agrylus species in, in the um, metallic wood boring family. And it's just probably one of those once in the career type of things. We might see more of it in 2023, only time will tell. Um, the next interesting kind of fun thing I saw was a simultaneous mini outbreak of green striped maple worms and pink striped oak worms. And here's a picture of these green striped uh, maple worms. This is fun stuff because these are, these are really pretty caterpillars. Green striped maple worms feed on red maples. There aren't many insect pests that feed on red maples, but green striped maple worms do. And here's an image of the pink striped oak worms. What's fascinating to me is that you can, you can see anatomically, these are very similar caterpillars um, and they belong to the same family um, of, of caterpillar, of moth. They're in the giant silkworm and royal moth family. The other interesting thing is I've only seen one other outbreak of these critters back in 2008. They also had a simultaneous outbreak. So that was kind of interesting. Maybe you'll see more of these critters in 2023. Um, the next interesting kind of fun thing was up at our Carlos Avery Wildlife Management Area in Anoka and Chisago County. Um, I was doing some field work and I was getting back to my trunk and I heard what I thought was, I mean, it sounded like rain on the, the cab of the, uh, and the, and the hood of the truck, but it was a bright, sunny day, clear blue skies. And so I knew there was some sort of critter pooping out frass that was raining down on the truck and I was underneath mature red pine. And I searched and searched and I finally found the culprit. It was a saw fly. Um, 
I think it's probably, it was the European pine sawfly. Um, the European pine sawfly looks a lot like our red pine sawfly. They have a very subtle difference in the way they feed on, on pines, but you can't see that until they've kind of done a lot of, a lot of damage. I think this was probably European pine sawfly. Kind of an interesting tidbit about this is that um, further north in Pine County two years prior, I saw quite a few of these feeding on jack pine. So I'm told that these aren't too uncommon, but it was just kind of an interesting thing. They feed on older pine needles. Um, they, I'm not aware of any time that they've done serious concerning damage to pine. The red pine shoot brought moth was in its third year of kind of outbreak in 2022. Although my teammates and I think that we saw less damage um, than in prior years. This is a caterpillar that kind of bores down the, the shoot tips of red pine. It's, it's noteworthy in that it mimics Diplodia shoot blight, which is a very, very common disease on red pine. So, um, I guess the point here is that if you see shoot light on red pine, it's not always the protea shoot light. Um, it requires closer investigation to confirm. And it's pretty easy to identify this, this pest because it pours right down the middle of the, the shoots. You can see the exit hole there at the base of the terminal bud on the bottom center picture. And this, this had a very extensive outbreak. Is it concerning? No. Um, this was fascinating. Uh, we had a report from a few people up around Bemidji area, you can see on the map, that, that red zone, where there are these things called tongue galls on aspen catkins. And so fascinating factoid about this is that this gall is caused by a fungus. In it, the genus name is Tephrina. Um, Tephrina can cause leaf disease on several different species that I'm aware of. Well, I should say it can, it can cause uh, uh, a disease on oak leaves that's really common, a different species. But this species here um, causes the female flower parts to enlarge into a gall. It's called tongue galls. Kind of an interesting phenomenon. We had quite a few, particularly my teammate in in Brainerd area, Rachel Duby, she got quite a few um, calls from curious Minnesotans about galls on oaks. And galls on oaks are very common. They're almost never concerning. Most of them are caused by a wasp in the cynipid family, cynipid wasps. 75% um, of cynipid wasps cause galls on oaks. And there are like 800 species roughly. And so um, you can see that there's a huge variety of, of galls on, on oaks that are caused by cynipid wasps. And just going left to right, that's a woolly oak gall on the left caused by a cynipid. That middle one is oak fig gall caused by a different cynipid species. And the one on the right, those are called spangle galls caused by a different cynipid species. Now, not all galls are caused by cynipid wasps on oaks. There are some, there's a fungus that causes a big gall. Um, there, are, there are several different types of critters that can cause galls. Most are cynipid wasps. This picture on the right though shows oak leaf blister, which looks like a gall. It's really just kind of a leaf swelling that's hollow on the other side. That's caused by a fungus. Um, there is a really good kind of pictorial a uh, pictorial guide on oak galls and all the different critters that can cause them from, and it's from the Field Museum in Chicago. So if you just typed, if you Googled galls, Chicago region, Field Museum, you would, you would find this poster. It's a really cool, kind of pretty poster that shows you the wide variety of galls that can be caused on oaks. All right, moving on to a couple um, climate related topics, flooding and drought, first flooding. Um, Last year, almost a year ago, uh, northern Minnesota experienced extreme flooding. Uh, I know that, let's see here, there was serious flooding along the Rainy and Pigeon Rivers along the Canadian border in April, made a lot of news, caused a lot of strife. Um, and then in May, there was a lot of 
um, serious heavy rains in central Minnesota. If you look at the northeastern part of Minnesota, the, our climate zone there, St. Louis County, Cook County, and Lake County, that climate zone experienced its, its wettest spring on record in 2022. So that's March through April, the wettest one on record was in 2022. And the other climate zones in the northern third of Minnesota also experienced extremely wet, like top 10 wettest springs on record. Um, the ramifications for forests aren't super negative for April flooding because April typically is before majority of trees have broken bud. And when trees don't have leaves, flooding isn't as big, doesn't have as big of a negative consequence. If flooding occurs during leaf out or after leaf out, it has bigger ramifications. And what does that look like? It looks like delayed dieback development. And so dieback after flooding might not develop until the following year, or it might not develop until even two years later. And then subsequent dieback continues to develop for a few years. And so these are just pictures that, you, that show a, a wide variety of symptoms caused from flooding. Key point is it's delayed in, on deciduous trees. Um, there, you know, the 2000, 20 through 22 kind of drought era has gotten a lot of attention and rightly so. But flooding has caused a tremendous amount of damage in Minnesota too. Um, this series of maps shows 90th percentile or higher of, of growing season precipitation. So April through September. And I want you to key in on these circled areas, these areas that are like lavender or purple or even like whitish pink. All of those circled areas represent um, 90th percentile or greater all time on, on the all time list in, our, in, in recorded history going back to 1895. In other words, these are about these circled areas represent the 12 wettest growing season on, on record. So you can see in the last, what is that, nine years? we've experienced a tremendous amount of very intensive growing season precipitation events. And through, through my um, field investigation work, um, clearly extreme precipitation is responsible for declining oaks, uh, you know, dieback and mortality in a scattered fashion across the landscape. In central Minnesota, you can see various instances in Lax, Pine County, Isanti County, and then if you go south of the Twin Cities and in, in Rice County and way down on the Iowa border, these areas clearly sustain um, kind of long-term dieback and decline because of flooding events or years with multiple flooding events. Um, related to this, in a way, I'm gonna talk about the mid-December slush crush. Um, so in mid-December of 2022, not too long ago, Many of you, I'm sure, remember. Many of you lost power, I'm sure. Um, there was a very intense um, snow, heavy snow precipitation event where most of Minnesota um, received the, the normal quantity of December precipitation in a five-day period. Um, these maps show on the left that shows accumulated snow. The map on the right shows 72-hour accumulated precipitation. Um, this damaged a lot of trees, a lot of trees. Um, if we zoom in to the northeastern area, that so that white outline is the area of the most snow, so over 24 inches of snow. You can see, though, that the area of highest precipitation, excluding that little, that little orange, like reddish orange zone in Lake County, um, you can see that the area of most precipitation kind of extended beyond the area of most snow. And if, if we take a look at the forests that sustained the most damage from this slush crush storm, it was on the southern edge of the area with, that received the highest precipitation total in that 72-hour precipitation map. Um, very, very rough estimate from um, Pine County foresters and state of Minnesota foresters who work in Pine County is that there was a five to 10 forest volume loss in 
in kind of southeastern Carleton County and northeastern Pine County in areas of, in, in Wisconsin adjacent to this area. My, my, team, my uh, counterpart over there already did kind of a forest damage assessment survey and he, he delineated 80,000 acres in Douglas County, Wisconsin of, of forest damage from this storm. Um, the most concerning forests that were damaged from the storm are, are young aspen stands. A lot of them were laid over by this really heavy snow. A lot of our plantations, particularly those that were recently thinned, our red pine plantations sustained some serious damage too, up to 20% is the estimate in mature red pine plantations. Um, time you know, will tell if our young red pines that were just encased in heavy snow sustained damage too. I suspect we might see quite a bit of kind of dieback on young red pines, or that is a possibility from just branches ripping off and then possibly diplodia shoot blight kind of in, or diplodia causing canker in those wounded areas. That's a possibility. The good news though is that in the short, you know, short term, it, there, is, there is no real insect and disease concerns from this mid-December snow damage to, to pines. Um, it's more the physical damage that is the concern. The only thing that I'm aware of that will certainly take advantage of, of killed material, killed red pine material, are our native bark beetle species in the Ips genus. So, so they're commonly referred to as pine engravers, pine engraver bark beetles. We know from a very similar event that was well documented in Ontario in the late 90s that bark beetles, they will prefer in 2023, this spring, they'll prefer to infest and feed upon the cambium in broken tops, so snapped off tops, like this arrow is pointing to, and snags. So snags without any living branches attached to them. Those will likely be attacked if the same exact thing happens as it did in Ontario, and it probably will. Those will be utilized first by the bark beetles. Um, and then uprooted pines or blown over pines, they'll be attacked too to some degree. Um, heavily leaning pines and those pines that sustain over 25% crown loss, those will likely be attacked in the Ontario um, January slush crush, let's call it. Um, though the heavy leaner, so the pines that remain living, they actually weren't attacked until two or three growing seasons after the, the damage. So if you're looking into salvaging material, um, you know, any, any material with that's, that has value that's in, in a top or in a stag or in an uprooted pine, those would be the things to remove from the wood before about this June because they will be attacked and the blue stain will develop because the bark beetles vector in a blue stain fungus. But, but going back, I'm not concerned for the residual forest from the snow damage. Okay, um, with the aspen sands, that's a bigger concern. Um, and the only way we're really gonna know if they're gonna be able to recover straight now is, is by assessing them over the next few growing seasons, determine if they're sufficiently stocked and if they're not, going to have to do some silvicultural manipulations to kind of start those young aspen stands over, unfortunately. Okay, on to drought. The areas circled on this map um, indicate kind of the bottom 20th percentile uh, on the historic record for, for growing season precipitation. So you can see in 2020, 2021, and 2022, there were a lot of areas in the state that sustained some serious drought. Um, Last year in 2022, it was really from the Twin Cities down southwest towards Mankato and beyond that sustained the worst drought. Um, we, we saw though drought complications from the 2021 drought in 2022. And just as a reminder, that 2021 drought, that was the driest growing season in Minnesota since 1976 for the entire state. If you just take a look at the Northern Third, 2021 was the driest growing season since the 19, 1936 or something like that. Really dry in 2022. And here were the kind of the, the kind of the, the pests that took advantage of these really drought stressed trees in 2022. 
So I'm going to talk about a few of these. We saw an uptick in normal area root disease. Here's an image of an oak on the left that, that died from armillary root disease over two years. Um, armillaria, you know, it's everywhere. It's, it's part of the native uh, fauna or flora in the soil. And it just, it takes advantage of really stressed trees and kills them. Um, it creates these mycelial fans in the cambial zone of dying trees. And sometimes you'll get on oaks, you'll get this kind of uh, black oozing substance that that it'll it will dry and it'll just be this black kind of dried up blood quote unquote if you'll if the, on the outside of the bark that is over these mycelial fans. So if you see the bl the bleeding kind of this black oozing on oak bark, what that tells you is that is that there is something disturbing or killing the candy on the bark. That's all that means. A bunch of things can cause that. Two-lane chestnut bor, um, as we as we expected, um, it increased in population and the damage it causes drastically between 2021 and 2022. Two-lane chestnut bor always does this after really severe droughts. Um, again, just like our malaria root disease, two-lane chestnut bor attacks stressed oaks, really stressed oaks. Um, a key uh, thing to note about two-line chestnut borer is if it's attacking a tree, the leaves will persist, in, the dead leaves will persist in the canopy for many weeks, which is in great contrast to oak oak. Um, two-line chestnut borer, if you remove the bark on some of these dying trees, you might find some of these feeding tunnels that the larvae make. They're kind of like etch-a-sketch etch -sketch galleries. Um, the adults leave these D-shaped exit holes that can be oriented in any direction. What was fascinating in 2022, kind of all over Minnesota, was that throughout the growing season, shaded oaks um, in the understory died in droves all over from two-line chestnut borer and from armillaria. So here are just some pictures that show that. I think I have about 50 pictures of instances where, where this occurred. It was pretty fascinating to see. And this just goes to show that oaks, which are shade intolerant, that are growing in the shade, they're already stressed just from growing in the shade. So if you throw on um, uh, an extreme drought, they are at a competitive disadvantage relative to the trees that are in full sunlight. And so they're more stressed than, than, the, than the canopy trees. Unfortunately, though, Starting in about mid-August 2022, we started seeing uh, oak forests in certain parts of the state where a lot of co-dominant and dominant oaks started dying from two-line chestnut borer. Now, these trees were dying in one growing season from two-line chestnut borer, or they were dying 90% 90 90 of their canopy was dying from two-line chestnut borer. And that happens with two-line chestnut borer on really, really stressed oaks, oaks that succumb, succumb to drought conditions like those in 2021, or if they were flooded, for example, they will drop, die in a single growing season from two-line chestnut borer. So this picture shows, and where we saw this, where we're aware that this occurred was around the Twin Cities, in an area southeast of Onamia in Mille Lacs County, in forests east of Little Falls, which you are seeing here, um, in kind of southern Mille Lacs, did I say? sorry, southeast of Onoemia County in Canabic County. This is a shot of kind of central or northern Mille Lacs County where we lost a lot of mature oaks too in mid-August or between mid-August and mid-September of 2022. And that was all because of the drought followed up by two-line chestnut borer infestation. So we're hoping that the peak populations for most of Minnesota occurred in 2022, although for central kind of in southwestern Minnesota, peak populations will likely occur in 2023. Something that you can do to avoid additional mortality from two-line chestnut borer is if you had a stand that was scheduled for thinning and you're able to delay that, that would be a good idea because thinning temporarily stresses um, forest too. In the long run, it helps them actually withstand uh, stresses from droughts more so. But in the the initial like growing season after thinning, oak stands are actually more stressed, or, or any stand is a little bit more stressed. Um, and, and we know that two-line chestnut borer has you know takes advantage of really drought stressed 
folks like like this image shows between 2013 and 2015, there was a massive amount of, of mortality caused by two-line chestnut borer because in 2012, that growing season, the latter half of the growing season was uh, an extremely dry period, extremely dry. I think about five and a half inches below the average from July through September in a lot of Minnesota. And so if you can avoid drought or if you can avoid thinning in 2022 and 2023, that would, that would probably minimize the impact of two-line chest and board that will occur. All right, on to oak wilt. I love talking about oak wilt because it is one of those few um, forest health problems that you can actually stop dead in its tracks on a stand scale. I recommend surveying for oak wilt later, like late July to mid-August. There's actually kind of a small window of time where it's kind of effective to survey for oak wilt. Um, and if you find it, take action. If you do so, you're going to save a tremendous amount of oaks um, and you're going to prevent buckthorn encroachment, common buckthorn encroachment uh, or red maple encroachment. Um, and that it would be a good thing for the oak forest. How do you identify oak wilt? Well, um, the best indicator is rapid leaf drop. If you're walking around the woods um, and you see a ton of leaves that fell off the tree in, from you know end of June through August, it's a very good indicator that oak wilt is very close by. Look up and, and look for any oaks that are rapidly dropping their, their leaves. It's a very drastic disease on red oaks. Oaks will shed like 90% of their canopy um, in, in roughly two months, like, like you see, you can see here. Um, oak wilt, the range of oak wilt, we didn't, we are always looking for it hard and it didn't um, take any huge leaps in 2022. The blue dots here are, were 2022 confirmations. Um, so that's good. Um, our general recommendation is if you are in that orange zone, which is a 20 mile buffer around all known oak wilt confirmations. If you're able to avoid harvesting April 1st through July 15th, you're going to be avoiding a tremendous amount of new oak wilt infections. Um, good news is that, that that date varies considerably by area in the state and by year. And, and University of Wisconsin Egg Station came out with this awesome tool where you can type in your lat long to get the, um, the, the specific risk for oak wilt for your specific spot on earth. And like I said, it, it varies considerably. Um, just to give you an idea, in Rochester, Minnesota, in 2012, the risk for oak wilt started on March 21st, 2012. Last year, the risk for oak wilt in Rochester, Minnesota started on May 8th. So like I said, it, the start date for oak wilt risk varies considerably. If you have any questions on oak wilt management, I highly recommend going to the Minnesota DNR Forest Health website, finding the oak wilt section, and finding our oak wilt guide. It has, a, it, it kind of lists out all the options for controlling oak wilt. All right, moving on to pines. Um, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about ramifications from that 2021 drought. Going back to the previous really severe, really, really severe drought in drought Minnesota, 1976. Um, the DNR in 1976 reported 53% mortality of planted pines back then. And you can see the, the growing season was like eight inches below normal. Fast forward to 2021, um, in, in the area where we recorded 55% mortality, the growing season was, was almost six inches below normal. So you can see um, bad droughts kill a lot of planted seedlings. Um, there are areas though in circled here where um, we documented over 75% mortality of our planted pines. Good news though, is that last year, Survival, the, the, our preliminary observations was that survival of our planted pines was back to normal. Again, to be expected with normal spring precipitation. Real quick, Brian, sorry, yeah. uh, about, about 15 minutes. Oh dear, all right. 
I see. All, all but there's right. not many questions in chat, so it's all right if you spend a little bit extra. So no sweat. All right. Thanks, Lane. I'm going to talk a little bit here about Diplodia. So Diplodia is a, a fungal a fungal disease that is kind of a big deal in nursery settings, and sometimes in outplantings in in the woods or in plantations too. Um, it's an opportunist though. So if a, a seedling or a tree isn't severely stressed, it's not really going to cause serious problems. It's all throughout Minnesota and Wisconsin and Michigan. It's everywhere. Um, and things that give the Clodian edge are the shock of planting. Obviously, that's a very rough transition in the tree's life. Shade is very stressful for red pine. Red pine is shade intolerant. So if it's growing in the shade, it's stressed. It's going to be more susceptible to bigger impacts from the Clodia. Competing vegetation obviously takes sunlight and moisture away from, from neighboring young red pine. That stresses it. And then drought, frost, pockets, hail, these all stress pines and can cause diplodia shoot blight or canker, like you can see on the right here on this severely drought stressed red pine. So we test for, for um, diplodia in the nursery. Diplodia is one of many, many uh, fungal pathogens that can cause latent infections. In other words, they're endophytes. So they can infect trees, but not cause any disease until the tree is stressed. So we test for those latent, um, latent infections in our nursery. And you can see, once we remove the windrows of red pine in 2003 or four, the incidence of the Clodia latency crashed. And we pretty much fixed the problem in our nurseries. Now, we can't fix um, really wild weather that mother nature throws at us. So in 2016, in Minnesota nurseries and Wisconsin nurseries, there was an outbreak of Diplodia in our nurseries and we had to destroy our fields that had a lot of infection. Um, but you can see in subsequent years, we found very little Diplodia in our nurseries. And so suffice it to say that Diplodia coming um, on from nurseries is, is a rare thing. Usually Diplodia um, is going to come from the surrounding landscape. Um, and to drive this point home, back in 2021, when we lost all these red pines, red pine bare root seedlings from our nurseries actually outperformed white pine and spruce. And white pine and spruce don't, don't um, have problems from diplodia that, in, in, at the seedling level in, in our nurseries. Okay, on to bark beetles. Historically, they're a problem during, this, during severe droughts, and that was an issue in northwestern Minnesota in 2021. The good news is that in 2022, we didn't have any issues with bark beetle outbreaks, any extensive issues with bark beetle outbreaks in the state. So that's good news. Um, on the spruce budworm, spruce budworm was as high as it's ever been in terms of the amount of land that it defoliates going back all the way to 1995. Spruce bugworm, it's a native insect that prefers to feed on balsam fir. It, allows, it also really likes white spruce. Um, the history of spruce bugworm is pretty interesting to follow in Minnesota's Arrowhead region. So I'm gonna show you a series of areas that were affected by spruce bugworm starting in 1983 and 1995 to 2000. It was in Northwestern St. Louis County. Then it's kind of marched east over time to the current area of infested area in last like the last two years. So it really is persistent in the arrowhead. Um, what was unique about 2022 is we mapped 6,000 acres of defoliated spruce and balsam for west of Itasca and Kuchichin County. And I'm not aware of any time where we've mapped more damage in that area. Um, I, I look back um, through 2006, and it hasn't even been close. So um, in 2022, we mapped three and a half times more spruce bugworm defoliation west of Itasca and Kuchichin County than we've, than, than we've ever mapped going back to 2006. Just a few suggestions here on spruce bugworm management. Monitor your woods. If they get defoliated for serious, like heavy defoliation for three to five years, it would be a good idea to consider setting up a salvage sale if there's a market or um, 
setting up a, a kind of a salvage sale to reduce wildland fire fuels. If you're able to diversify a stand, you're 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 going to be able to you're you're reducing the future risk of budworm impact. White spruce plantations might not be the greatest uh, idea for Minnesota. They sometimes can sustain um, populations of spruce budworm that just kind of peck away at them and just kind of make the make them decline. On to tamarack. Eastern larch beetle um, is a native bark beetle. Um, we mapped a record high number of affected acres in 2022. You can see that we've had we've been experiencing a growing outbreak of eastern larch beetle since 2001. Here's an, the area of accumulated impact of eastern larch beetle um, going back to 2001. The black polygons that are were were newly affected areas that were not affected prior to 2022. Um, but the gray areas are areas that were mapped prior to in 2022 or before. So this is just the accumulated area impacted. This amounts to about 70% of Minnesota's total area of tamarack forest. So large field is affecting a huge area. That area, if you were to smoosh all the forests together that have been affected by eastern large beetle, it is equivalent to the area of these lakes combined. So Upper Red, Lower Red, Lake Winnie, Leech Lake, and Mille Lacs Lake combined. So that just kind of gives you a visual for how many, how much Minnesota forest has been affected by this native bark beetle. So that's, that's bad. It's bad that we're losing all these mature trees. There's no indication that the outbreak is gonna stop. We keep mapping more and more. But my opinion, I think tamarack, it's a great species for Minnesota still. Um, it, it grows in, in environments that don't grow a lot of other species. It's a beautiful tree. Um, and those bark beetles don't attack regeneration. So really young seedling saplings. Um, Amy Shawnette was a graduate student who recently um, completed her thesis work. She was, the, she was a grad student of Professor Marcella Windmuller Campion. And, and they found that a lot of these tamarack stands that have been kind of decimated by Eastern large beetle, they're naturally regenerating back to other trees, including a lot of tamarack. So that's great news. Um, um, we know that uh, an um, Professor Brian Ockma and his lab at the University of Minnesota has demonstrated that, in the, that, a, that a lengthening growing season has given an advantage to the eastern large beetle. It's, it's sometimes able to produce two generations per year, which uh, large beetle or tamarack is not used to dealing with. Um, there's, so there's that factor that's giving large beetle an advantage. Um, I suspect there are other factors though too, perhaps um, large areas, extensive areas across the state of Minnesota, which have very little diversity and large tamaracks. Um, so there's a ton of hosts. There was a ton of hosts out there for large beetle to kind of ramp its population up. Also, when you take a look at the weather record for kind of the Northern half of Minnesota, the area of Minnesota that is that has experienced large beetle outbreaks severely, if you take a look at the growing season, so April through September precipitation, there are some noteworthy events here. Namely, 1999 was the third wettest growing season on record, right? So you can imagine that a lot of these tamarack swamps um, were inundated with water. And, you know, even, our, even the trees that grow in wet zones and where other trees won't, even those flood tolerant trees can be flooded and killed. So this likely stressed a lot of tamaracks, perhaps gave large beetle um, a little bit of an advantage. And then of course, there, since that time, there have been other great stress events um, that, you can, that you can see on the screen here that have occurred concurrently with this outbreak. And then there's, the, there's a concurrent outbreak of a non-native defoliator 
of tamarack called the large case bear. Um, the large case bear is this cute little caterpillar that kind of sucks the life out of the needles and makes them look like straw. And you can see concurrent to the large beetle, there's been a lot of large case bear defoliation. Um, and so it's not like that doesn't stress a tree, right? So in 2022, though, we actually didn't map much um, large beetle defoliation. Moving on to Aspen, what was really interesting thing in 2022 is at least from the Twin Cities all the way to the Canadian border, there were all these aspen trees out there that grew very tiny, tiny leaves. Um, um, most of these trees didn't, we didn't see, see them die, but certainly this was most likely a response to the 2021 drought. I know we documented, I'm trying to look at my cheater notes here, yes. Um, so not only were the leaves stunted, but also aspen trees across the northern part of the state produced a huge seed crop in 2021. That's, that was likely um, caused by those aspen trees experiencing severe drought the prior year. Um, we actually documented that in 1989, heavy, heavy aspen seed production the year after the really severe drought of 1988. Um, in Cook County, we mapped a bunch of like large aspen tortrix defoliation. That's a native critter that defoliates aspen trees. Um, it was at its highest level in 13 years. Um, we also mapped a bunch of defoliation of aspen trees where we weren't able to clearly see a clear cause that could be caused by tortrix, or it could have been the stunted leaves from the drought and the heavy seed production, or maybe it was forest tech caterpillar. So we aren't sure. Um, we mapped, as we always do, a lot of acreage, acreage with aspen decline. This isn't anything unusual, but I suspect, suspect because of that 2021 drought that we might see a little bit more aspen decline going forward of older stands. Basswoods, um, kind of an interesting phenomenon is happening with basswoods. It started in 2021. And this um, non-native critter called the introduced basswood thrips um, started defoliating basswoods. Like, and the result is kind of intense defoliation in the early summer or late spring to basswoods. Um, populations move northward of defoliating thrips, as you can see on the map on the right. Um, thrips are super tiny. I have circled them here. Um, they just like look like little light green flecks on the leaves. They actually start doing their damage inside the bud as it's swelling. And so sometimes these leaves emerge looking damaged. So this, this basswood thrips um, defoliation actually mimics late frost damage. Um, so it'll be really interesting to see what happens in 2023. Um, Wisconsin also recorded a lot of basswood thrips damage, but we suspect that populations will crash sometime soon. Forest tank caterpillar, populations remain surprisingly low. Here's where we map primarily light defoliation, kind of centered in a way around Mille Lacs Lake. Um, you can see the last time we recorded a lot of defoliation was way back in like 2003. We are due for a huge outbreak in a forest tank caterpillar in the upper Midwest. I'm just waiting for it, but I don't think it's gonna happen in 2023. Um, we're due. Emerald ash borer, it didn't take any giant leaps in range in 2022. The yellow areas in the map that you can see here were newly quarantined for emerald ash borer in 2022. Um, these purple points show where emerald ash borer has been confirmed as of December of 2022. Something that I like to look at is the discovery rate of emerald ash borer. And it's surprisingly consistent around the Twin Cities kind of epicenter. It's been discovered moving outward three miles per year. In the Duluth area, the same can be said. It's being discovered at about three miles per year. So um, just some unsolicited commentary from me on Emerald Ash Borer. It might not impact your area for a long time. It might be discovered in your town tomorrow but it might not impact the, the forest 
for, for a, a considerable amount of time. Um, it's, it's impact at the local level is relatively slow if you're talking about like salvaging ash timber. Um, if there is a market, you're going to have time to salvage that. Um, very roughly in, in, in Wisconsin, in southern Minnesota, it's like once it's discovered in an area within about 10, 10, a 10 mile radius, you'll see widespread noticeable infestation after about six years, just to give you an idea. Now, of course, so you might have time to salvage timber, but what no one has time for is converting forests that are heavy to ash to forests that are more resilient because they have more diversity. So if we're able to diversify um, our, our, our black ash forests, that would be a very good thing. Way easier said than done. There are a lot of um, kind of diversify, diversification projects going on in Minnesota and Wisconsin, and you can find some of those at the Great Lakes Silvicultural Library under the ash button. Okay, it's, I'm, I'm 48 minutes in. I'm going to burn through borough blight. It's one of my favorite topics to talk about, so I'm going to talk about it. Darn it. Burroughs were first noted as getting more disease in southern Minnesota in the late 1990s. Fast forward to 2012, a professor at Iowa State confirmed that the cause of this leaf disease was Tubacchia ioensis, which is a native leaf pathogen. It causes these symptoms. Leaf vein flecking can be seen on the left. You might start seeing that in July. The wedge-shaped area of dead leaf tissue that's quite diagnostic for burrow blight on burrows. You can see that maybe late July, August, early September. And then it causes these fruiting structures that are visible on swollen petioles that you can see on the right. Um, you do get leaves and petioles scattered about the, the canopy that persists throughout the winter time, and they serve as the spore source for emerging leaves the following spring. Now, a lot of other problems on oaks can cause leaves to persist in the canopy. So it's not necessarily burrow blight if you see that. Burrow blight, as you can see in this picture, in that, that middle um, defoliated burrow is flanked by two burrows to the left and right that are just totally healthy. So we can say that burrow blight causes severe leaf loss on some burrows in the later growing season. And it's, it generally seems to be increasing in incidence. And we know that wet growing seasons promote more burrow blight. You can see that if you compare our most recent normal period, 1991 to 2020, and look at the mean and subtract the old, um, the long-term kind of average, 1895 to 1970, you can see all climate zones in Minnesota's forested areas are wetter than they used to be. That, that promotes more fungal leaf disease. You can see that as you go south of Minnesota, it's gotten wetter than it has in the north. Um, but I really am, I really am curious about the impact of Baroque blight. So I have uh, a bunch of plots that I've looked at Baroque blight's impact in early September. And basically, 2% of Baroques are severely defoliated by mid-September every year. Um, so not a lot of Baroques are severely impacted. And, I and I've also taken a look at several um, severely impacted oaks that get severe, they, they get severe um, burrow blight every year. And you can see that in September, they look crappy, but the following June, they look fine and they don't have any dieback. So here's a burrow in Sherburne County. If you fast forward five years, you see the same thing. In September, they look bad. In June, they look fine and there's no dieback developing. Here's another example from 2015. Gets burrow blight every year. June, it looks fine. Fast forward five years, same thing. So I'm concluding that I'm not concerned about burrow blight across the landscape. It's not a concern to unstressed burrows. A lot of research question remain, questions remain, though, that researchers could tackle. Um, but I think in, when you're taking a look at burrow health and, and actually white oak health, too, there are bigger environmental factors and diseases to be concerned about than for Oakland. So with that, thanks for listening. Hope you learned something.
Thanks, Brian. Um, and there are quite a few questions actually that have that have come in. Um, so thanks everyone for for sending those in. Uh, could you remind us how nurseries fix the latent diplodia problem? Um, so nurseries in the upper Midwest used to have windrows of big, tall red pines. And those big, tall red pines, they were infected with diplodia shoot blight. So a, a large red pine frequently is houses a bunch of diplodia that really isn't affecting the, the mature pine too badly. But every growing season when it's wet, the diplodia on uh, frequently on the cones of these mature red pines, um, it'll fruit and produce a bunch of spores and then rain will hit those spores and splash thousands, probably millions of diplodia spores. And, and that's how this disease spreads. And so these rain droplets with thousands to millions of diplodia spores rain down on the, on the red pine seedlings near these windrows of red pine and infect the, the seedlings. And so eventually nursery manage, managers in the upper Midwest were convinced that diplodia was a problem and they removed all those windrows of red pine. And as soon as they did, did that, the incidence of diplodia latent, latency just crashed in, in upper Midwest nurseries. And is it okay to thin red pine stands this summer that have light to moderate snow damage? That's a great question. Um, is it okay to, to thin red pine plantations this summer? I would say yes. Um, Diplodia, or excuse me, bark beetles, our native bark beetles, they've only been documented as causing outbreaks in red pine plantations during years of extreme drought. So in, if, if we have like a, a drought on the level of 1976, 1988, or 2021, and you thin a red pine plantation during that drought year, you do risk an outbreak of, red, of bark beetles to the residual pines. Likewise, if you thin the plantations this winter, the, the winter before a really severe drought, you you risk a potential outbreak to residual pines. But of course, you can't we can't predict drought. And so I would say yes, as, as long as we aren't experiencing a severe drought, thinning should be fine this summer. Um, and as uh, may, maybe you touched on this a little bit, but this follow-up question, can pines sometimes survive bark beetles or once the beetles are present, should they just immediately be salvaged? And if pine can survive beetles, then what's that trigger point for salvage? Can bark, can... And yeah. I can paste it in the chat here. It's it's in the... Uh... Yeah. Um, I, I would say that, yes, uh, mature red pine can be attacked by... Pine, pine engravers, and it can survive that attack. The result might be a lost limb or a couple lost limbs. And then the, the tree is able to fend itself off, off or protect itself sufficiently enough with chemicals, resin, saps to ward off any attack to its main trunk. Um, what is the trigger point? That's a great question. Uh, I don't know. Um, I would say that you know, if you're out in a plantation um, and you're looking at healthy looking red pines and um, you're noticing a lot of their crowns rapidly turning brown, that would be a point where you could consider a salvage or a pre-salvage operation to minimize losses due to bark beetle outbreaks. Again, I would not expect that to happen unless we are in severe, severe drought. Now, um, the problem also is that symptom development from bark beetle attack is delayed. So um, we, my, my teammate, Megan O'Neill, experienced that in 2021 where bark beetles started attacking pine plantations in later summer 
and symptoms didn't develop on heavily infested pines until later in the fall or even in the winter. We also documented that occurring in, in um, after the 1988 drought. So determining when to salvage is an art form, I would say. And another question, does thinning spruce plantations uh, and removing balsam fir make them more resilient to spruce budworm outbreaks? I've seen one paper suggesting it, but wondering what your experience is. I don't have experience with that. So I can't speak from experience. I'm familiar with that paper though. And my former, uh, my former teammate, Mike Albers, worked with um, Matt Russell, formerly of University of Minnesota, and looked kind of at the long-term impact of thinning um, white spruce plantations. And they did find that thinning white spruce plantations made them more resilient to spruce budworm defoliation. Now, of course, those spruce, I, and I believe that like, like red pine plantations, you generally don't want to, to thin during a stressful time. So if you're having heavy defoliation of, of spruce budworm, you wouldn't want to thin because you could do more damage than, than good. So if you're able to thin prior to defoliation, many years before drought, you're going to be making those stands more resilient. But I don't have any experience to speak of on that topic. And is there a possibility some of the aspen defoliation that you are seeing is actually from spongy moth? My teammate in, in Grand Rapids, Eric Otto, he ground truthed some of the um, unknown causes of defoliation, some of those forests that had unknown causes of defoliation. And he didn't find any consistent, uh, consistent sign of any defoliator. So in other words, he didn't find any consistent remnants of forest and caterpillar, like their pupil cases everywhere. Um, he, did, he did find a little bit of, of um, large aspen tortrix sign, their pupil cases. Um, certainly if Eric would have find, found signs of spongy moth, he would have reported those. Um, and so I can confidently say Eric didn't see any signs of spongy moth. Could it be spongy moth? I suppose, um, although it would really surprise me given temperatures that are frequently seen in that area of the state. Okay. Uh, and lastly, if you do see signs or symptoms of armillaria, are there any silver cultural strategies that have worked uh, to limit its impact on crop trees or do you just kind of let it run its course? That's a great question. I have the same question. No one's ever done the research. Um, for years, I've recommended when, when foresters find a disease center in a red pine plantation, step number one, rule out heterobacidian root disease. Look for heterobacidian root disease fruiting structures on, on stumps. And you can learn about heterobacidian root disease on our website. We currently are, are not aware of any heterobacidian root disease in the state of Minnesota. After you've ruled out heterobacidian, um, basically, um, I recommend it in a managed plantation to, to remove at least one tier of healthy red pine encircling thin crowned red pine. So typically in these, um, these fungal disease centers and plantations, you have a middle a middle portion that is dead, that died quite a while ago, surrounded by dying pines, surrounded by pines that have unhealthy crowns, they're very thin, surrounded by healthy pines. And we've had very good luck actually in Sand Dune State Forest with these disease centers, removing one to two tiers of healthy, healthy red pine. And what that does is it pre-salvages mortality that is quite predictable. So these, these fungal, diseases, including our malaria, they just keep moving out. It doesn't matter if you cut a tree, the, the disease is going to infest the stumps root system and continue to move outward from the center. And so if you're able to remove about you know 60 feet of healthy red pine, you're removing the mortality that would occur within about 10 years between thinning cycles. But can you, you know, and so that's generally worked. I have 
I have wondered at times if it could actually accelerate the spread of our malaria root disease, but that's just kind of an insecure question I have. Um, there's no evidence that we're aware of to suggest that pre, pre salvaging does speeds up any root disease. But it would be cool if somebody could research that. Maybe they could put a case on the civil culture library. I they certainly could wouldn't indeed. complain. Um, and lastly, so we're right up at 10 a.m. here, so I understand that folks have to go. Um, our next webinar is going to be on April 11th. Uh, Dr. Marcella Wimmuller Campioni is going to give an update on biochar in the forest. There's been a, quite a few research projects that have um, addressed that, and she'll update. But for this last question here, um, all things considered, is the health of our forests overall remaining the same, declining, or improving? And are we starting to see declines of species on the southern edge of their range? Um, as assumed due to climate change? Um, I'm afraid I'm not qualified to answer that question. I'm not sure anyone is. Um, what's, ha what's happened with larch beetle? It's related to a changing climate for sure. Um, and tamarack. Uh, but are we losing kind of the southern edge of tamarack? Well, I mean, across the continent, actually, there are incidences of, uh, there are docu there's documentation of larch beetle attacking kind of the southern edge of tamarack across the continent. Um, and so that could be um, what we'll see moving forward, but we haven't documented that with any other boreal species like black spruce or jack pine or, um, paper birch. Um, I don't know what the future there holds. Um, regard, I, I have asked uh, actually Sue Crocker with U United States Forest Service FIA team to specifically look at white oak and bur oak to see if the mortality rates in the FIA data are increasing over time. Um, there is kind of a little bit of a red flag on white oak where its mortality rate is approaching a, a level that's, that's potentially concerning, not really concerning yet, but um, I do wonder about um, uh, a wetter environment and what that is doing to our forests. Um, and if that is playing a bit of a role in increasing the mortality rate on like oaks and white oaks. So I appreciate that question, but it's it's a bit beyond me. Well, all the same. Thanks so much for uh, presenting this today, Brian. Um, I appreciate it. And thanks to folks in chat for um, participating and, and adding questions. Um, again, we'll see you all uh, next month um, on April 11th. And have a great rest of your week. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Lane. Yep. Thanks, Bye. Brian. Bye.